Uh, by the way, I, I must say there, there is an example of nature uh, generating waste. It's, it's pretty old, but we had some microorganisms about two and a half to two billion years ago in the oceans. Um, these guys, they were the one actually using, uh, so, you know, um, uh, the, um, what do you say, uh, dissolved iron huh. and turned it into solid iron and they used the oxygen for that. And there were two waste products. One was iron ore, yeah. iron actually, uh, you know, precipitating. That became our iron, by the way, in Kiruna. So that's an ecosystem service. service. It's called banded <laughs> iron formations. <laughs> but the other thing, though, yeah. they produced was oxygen. Yes. So that put the oxygen into the oceans and later into the atmosphere. Yeah. And the oxygen was a waste product. And what happened to them? It killed them. Mm. So that's a that's good an story as well. You know. <laughs> they died from right. their waste. They died of oxygen. That's exactly. Right. Don't this waste is what happens. <laughs> So, by the way, on the panel here now, we have three really interesting and excellent people. We have Maria Schulz, Program Director of the Resilience and Development Program, SweetBio, uh, financed mainly by SIDA, but also a researcher very active at the Stockholm Resilience Center. I'm going to ask you a very quick question just to warm up as well. Maria, why did you get interested into the whole issue of ecosystem services, personally? Um, because I think it speaks um, better than any other terminology to the links between human and nature. Mm -hmm. Good. Can you take up your microphone a bit? Because it's falling. It's under. Oh, thank you. It's falling down for some reason. Great. Perfect. Uh, Filia Restiani. Uh, you are an economist uh, at the Stockholm International Water Institute um, and working on water, energy, and the food nexus, which is something we are many interested in. Why, why did you get interested into this subject? Well, uh, as an economist, uh, then, uh, and I'm an environmental economist, so that's what um, I work with. But I think more personal question, I, I grew up uh, that uh, my, my father really taught me to love nature, mm -hmm. to say, you know, we are very dependent on this, but really to, to recognize and to treasure nature. And I think that's very important, uh, especially in, uh, in everyday life here. I mean, in Sweden, that also makes a lot of difference in terms of how the private sector pra uh, practices, but uh, because they're really close to nature, and then this is uh, reflected in their uh, value of businesses. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at Asia or other more urbanized uh, environment, we see they are so far away, so retracted from nature, and that also affects how they see nature. And again, in terms of ecosystem services, then they feel more distant. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. I was just interested to get why, why did you start it? Uh, Jonas Alén is CEO of Storbrand Asset Management here in Sweden and Investment Manager for Sustainable Investments. Uh, what drove you into an interest for these subjects? Uh, for me personally, it was an interest in uh, developing markets and, and perhaps what set that apart from, uh, from, from markets here uh, in Europe and North America. I um, spent the first five years of my career as an investment banker and then I, I worked for CEDA for about five years, of, um, working on investment for sustainable development in Africa, Latin America. And um, so I had an interest and I often heard from asset managers saying that, well, we care about profitability and not sustainability. And I, my typical response is that, well, um, I care about profitability too, but that's because of that I care about sustainability, because I believe that the global trends in uh, sustainability will, will uh, change the framework for business in a fundamental way and will drive profitability with the corporations in the mm. future. So that's... Uh, okay, that's good to know. Maria, I will start with you, um, because you have quite recently uh, concluded a major um, study uh, how you actually on a national level try to make ecosystem services uh, more you know clear um, why did this study come about it's a bit of a translation of team into some kind of you know national policies why why did this study come about what was the decision behind that yeah, the reason behind that was that it's on multiple levels, but mm -hmm. we have, for example, Sweden is um, part of the Convention on Biodiversity with its uh, 20 IG targets, its targets uh, that the world are supposed to reach until 2020. And one of these targets uh, is about to value ecosystem services and get it integrated into decision making at all levels, development plans and so on. 
And then also we have uh, the Swedish 16 environmental quality objectives and also we have an EU strategy on biodiversity. So mm -hmm. that is the sort of political context. And the reason why we have this political context in the world is of course the needs as Pavan so greatly have expressed with your presentation. Um, so that's why Swedish government took the decision to, to do this inquiry. Mm -hmm. And when they took that decision, what kind of instruction did you, did you get? What, uh, what did they want really to get out of this yeah. study? They wanted us to look at um, both how to increase the knowledge on both biodiversity and ecosystem services and then how to get the value of, inter of ecosystem services visible and integrated into mm. decision making at all levels in society. Okay, that's very and interesting. Yeah. Then, I mean, this is, no, this is a state official report, so I mean, it actually sets the, um, or the framework for um, companies and business and financial markets, you know, so we haven't gone in so far into the actual financial sector in this report. It's more how the gov what, what's the responsibility of governments, you know, mm. with the, uh, the legal aspects and uh, economic instruments and so on, and how to facilitate for businesses to develop um, ecosystem services, innovations and so on. Mm. But also, I mean, the state have then also responsibility for sort of fair distribution, uh, benefit sharing of you know, it's how to regulate public goods quite a bit if you look at ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Because ecosystem services goods, it's um, also other services that underlie these goods for, the, for them to be able to be produced, like pollination and so on. So there it might be difficult, you know, to, to put responsibility totally on the companies. Mm -hmm. The state here has a, a responsibility to put the right economic instruments in place for companies to act and long-term economic instruments. Mm. To providing so it's a stable, enabling environment for businesses to act under. Okay, providing that framework. And as, as you said, though, um, you were looking at different levels also of governments and so on. How did you go about to, uh, to actually make the study? I mean, what was the process that you took on? A lot of consultations, it because has, we heard also yeah. from Pavan how important this is. Mm. It has been a lot of great work done, especially by the TIB team, and we had consultations with the international TIB team, and of course we have gone through the reports of TIB, you know, which is also, it's both sort of the, um, it's both facts and also how it's practical tools available through the mm. TIB work. And then it's also a lot of other practical tools out there, for example, by World Resources Institute on ecosystem services reviews, and so on. And then we had dialogues with Swedish companies and municipalities and uh, actors and youth, politicians. Mm. So we had had a number of dialogues in Swedish society to understand what obstacles are there and what possibilities mm. are there. Can you say, can you mention maybe one, I mean from that consultation, one interesting obstacle or one interesting possibility that sort of tends to come out? Well, the most interesting possibility I would say is that it's so much already done out there. Mm. You know, it's so many Swedish companies who already works with like ecosystem services mm. reviews and who have an interest in this, mm. which is not strange, you know, because for example, if you look at the World Economic Forum's <laughs> risk, global risk report 2013, uh, five of the eight most uh, high ranked risks for global economic development are ecosystem based. Okay. So I think m many companies do understand that the productive base comes from ecosystems mm. and you have to gather them long term sustainably to be able to get also mm. your long term income. But then of course you have a problem there that uh, companies also have to report to uh, the owners uh, in very short term. That's why also I mean the public, the, the governments have responsibility for regulations and so on. Mm. If, 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 you, if we would meet in the elevator, or even I, I, you would prefer to meet with uh, Fredrik Reinfeldt, I'm sure, but you know, if you happen to meet with some, <coughs> someone like that, or the CEO of this bank, who is probably somewhere in the building, uh, and he or she would ask you, uh, you know, what are the key points really that, that, that I should really take on board here? I understand there's a lot of stuff, of course, in the report. What, what would you select in that elevator pitch? Uh, for the financial sector, uh, in itself. I would say that... Um, well, in broad terms as well. I mean, 
But it's different if you if you speak to the finance yeah, minister. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Because it, I think you have you have to say that it's uh, government have some responsibilities. Good. Companies mm -hmm. have some other responsibilities, yeah. and then they need to cooperate. Yeah. Okay. You know? But so if I would meet uh, Swedbanks, I mean, for example, I, I met with um, the Nordic Investment Bank the mm. other day. Uh, they are looking for tools how to measure, how to see how investments they do affect ecosystem services. Mm. You know. And there, again, I mean, I think that uh, you, Pavan, for example, you are now developing a framework that could be used yeah. in that yes. kind of uh, right. work. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also we have some other tools, but we need these good examples when they have been implemented mm. you know, mm. to show mm. these people who actually seek advice. And we, we have, I have some uh, good examples, but I think we need really to compile these sort of success stories, what mm. has been done. You know, but okay. If I meet somebody in the elevator, then I would say that um, we we need to to work together somehow. You know, researchers and uh, and practitioners to find the right tools to help out, to help companies out, and to do better reporting. And that, of course, has to link to global level reporting. Mm. You know, because while Sweden is not an isolated island, uh, so we have to have some sort of measurement standardizations, I would say, for reporting for companies, so we can compare in between companies mm. in the end. And I think we're soon there with the excellent work of, for example, Pavan and others, you know, that we can see how, how we can actually formulate these kind of standards in a better way. Mm -hmm. It, it wasn't the pitch. But no, but it's good. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand that. And, and as you say, it's very important to understand that it's also different messages for different audiences to try to understand how it connects directly to them. Yeah. But can you maybe say uh, also, uh, you know, to finalize, you, you presented this to the government. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Ministry of Environment, they will, you know, cheer, I'm sure, and think this is great. But if you look at the broader government, what, what is the reaction to, to the report, if you have any that you could uh, share with us? Um, actually, most of the reactions I have had from companies. Okay, mm, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they see, they, they are, they are, to be honest, it's two different kinds of comments. I mean, one is uh, that they, they are a little bit worried about what maybe will come up mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms okay. of regulations and so on. And they need to be able to adapt to something they foresee will come. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other reaction is then that this is great, and and uh, I mean, many companies also have um, feel a responsibility. Mm. I would say, you know, that they have. It's not just regulations which drives companies' mm. development in these kind of areas like CSR. It's also that company leaders um, likes to work for society. And I, I think that your your book again, Pavan, Corporation 2020 shows that through history, you know, how actually corporations have worked together with society mm. uh, with this, some kind of responsibility, more by heart responsibility, mm. you know, that they want to do something good for society. Mm. And of course, then they are also interested in to sell products that consumers want. So with a higher and higher um, a knowledge that people have more and more uh, awareness of these issues, of course, you have also consumers who will demand these yeah. kind of products, you know. Mm. Uh, can, can you say one, just one word, the final word, uh, next steps, what will happen? I mean, you, you now present the report, we have hundreds of reports coming out all the time, and we want them to have an effect, of course, you know. Uh, what, what, what will happen now, do you know? Any, any sort of reaction? Well, all this, we have 25 action points, it's available on the internet, and uh, it's all about, um, it's action points, to, go, for example, to go through economic instruments uh, of which Swedish okay. society is using, etc., etc., and, mm. and how to support uh, businesses and how to also work with uh, effects like risks also for users, you know, that you have to have distributional uh, regulations, you know, how to distribute, re distribute um, the benefits when, if you do business arrangements and so on. But from this, and uh, now this, um, the inquiry has been sent out to Swedish society, so around the Swedish society now people are commenting on the report, okay. helping mm. out to improve it further. This was a short report, it was eight months. And then uh, the Swedish government are writing a bill uh, based on this report, this inquiry and other inquiries. Mm. And if it will be implemented, we have also an evaluation 
of it uh, planned for 2018. Uh, you know, so if if we would implement all the steps nearly in this report, we would say I, we say that it's a sort of uh, on the job Swedish team. You know, it's a decentralized Swedish team where we ask all entities in society to help out mm. to to come up with better measurements, to work together with mm. researchers and so on, to have. Uh, better data as well mm. in ecosystem services to be able to do multi-criteria analysis and so on uh, for different kinds of decisions in society. Okay, thank you very much Maria. I mean we wanted to take this opportunity to really focus a little bit on the report because it's just recently launched and it is available actually there in the summary format. It's much thicker than this uh, and I think the summary exists in English as well. Yes. So please read it. It's really interesting. It's an example of taking T mm. to the national yes. level and it's really trying to get operational. So thank you very much, um, Maria. Um, before I, I'm going to let um, uh, Jonas come in because you're going to comment sort of how do you from the corporate sector, mm. financial sector, take all these different scientific insights sure. uh, and turn it into practice. I'm going to ask um, Filia because you also come from a science policy uh, organization. Focusing on one of these boundaries, the freshwater boundary, as we heard also under a lot of pressure, and we also quite often hear that ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, are those most under threat if you take all ecosystems. What is, what is your, you know, looking at the work of the Stockholm International Water Institute, your background, what are your perspectives on what Pavan presented uh, and what you also heard from Maria now? Um. It's actually what uh, I, I totally agree with uh, what Papan said that, um, again, uh, I think he also really opened my eyes in terms of really focusing that it's actually 70% 70, 70 of the value creation uh, globally is mm -hmm. from the private yeah. sector. Mm -hmm. And we have been, uh, we have in our mindset that it's more government center that, you know, there are externalities, there are market values, but, uh, but it's the role of the government to correct it. And we've mm -hmm. seen from the experience that it's too overwhelming. Uh, the government doesn't have the resources, mm -hmm. the government doesn't have also all the knowledge necessary, uh, but of course it still, it has very important r uh, role in creating the environment where the private sector exactly. yes. can achieve to this uh, Corporation 2020 vision. Uh, and uh, at CUE, we. But before we try, that, can, yeah. can you say, if, are there any, because you say governments, and we have 200 yeah. governments out yes. there, are there any exam good example of a government that really seemed to take this seriously and appears to have a capacity to try to integrate it? Or is it all equally F? In grade. <laughs> uh, so I have to single out a very good example here. Um, I think actually there are a lot of uh, governments, uh, both uh, in developed countries and in developing countries, mm. uh, of course in different level, and uh, there are different uh, drivers of mm. why they're doing so. Again, if we look at Sweden, I really see that it's really that nature is part of the culture, okay. that it's, it's really making a lot of differences in terms of, in the private sector, in terms of investment, uh, uh, that it is part of the business value. They're really looking at this business continuity as well. So in terms of philosophy, in terms of uh, business arguments, it all makes sense. But of course they can go further. Mm. Uh, and that's another thing that I can also talk about. To which level, for example, uh, if we talk about ecosystem services, are they looking just at, you know, one step, uh, the, you know, the first year of uh, supply chain, for example, as required by uh, the Global Reporting Initiative? Mm. Or are they looking at... Mm to how long. And this is also that, of course, uh, it's something that needs to be discussed, uh, you know, the role of the government in terms of looking at, at which context we need to go further than just first tier, but mm. maybe, you know, more. Mm. Uh, but also in developing countries, uh, China, for example, has been so much, uh, you know, under uh, highlight. I, you know, that, uh, of course, uh, now they are, you know, a superpower already, mm. I would say, um, and, uh, and has also a lot of impacts in terms of ecosystem services. Uh, but I would say they are doing things. But, of course, the expectation is much higher, of course, mm. because the But it's moving the in impact. the right direction. I, I think so, but it still yeah. also has a lot of problems, a lot mm. of challenges. And one of our work is actually we're working with the Chinese government, with the Minister of Environmental Protection, uh, to look at water pollution control using economic instruments, and, and again, uh, this is also as what Maria has pointed out, there needs to be more uh, way of um, internalizing this uh, ecosystem services mm -hmm. in the economic, uh, in the, you know, in the formal economic. And so there should be 
long-term incentive mechanisms to mm. take into account of this. Uh, but what happens now, a lot of market-based instruments for what pollution control in this case, but in general also, they are still implemented mm. at the moment using project-based approach. Uh, just for the sake of having them. And this is very dangerous, actually, mm -hmm. because then we can say that there are market mechanisms, but it's actually, it can create further distortions. Uh, so this is also something that I think quite important to... And to what can you do about that in practical terms? Because this is going to be a little bit of a push here now. Yes. What? Okay, there is, there is a problem here. But you are from a research policy organization, so yeah. the politicians will come to you. What? Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is also what I say to the Chinese government, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, of course, it takes time. Everything mm. needs, you know, a gradual approach, but it's very important to have the right perspective, mm. that it's still holistic ecosystem perspective. Uh, and, and we have this uh, uh, precautionary principle, but we also have the polluter pays principle or in terms of uh, payment for ecosystem services. It's actually the uh, beneficiary pays principle. And we really have to, uh, when we're creating markets, that's very important. So the next step after having the, all this information, like Pafan pointed out, we need to internalize this. And when we're creating markets to take into account of this information, mm. I think we need to be, uh, I would say, in terms of the economist terms, to be quite you know, uh, strict in terms of, OK, we need to help the polluters responsible. Mm. It's not having, you know, Another uh, intermediator in this term normally is normally governments that actually distorting because then of course there are lobbying there are you know uh, so again this is uh, there are institutional issues mm, okay. that uh, that creates more problem. Well, well, what I think is interesting what Maria and her team has done is of course you know really looking at the national level I mean yep. taking a full grip of that because quite often we hear about we have an interesting project here an interesting example here. And then we suddenly have 300 case studies from the world, and we believe that things are happening, but really it only happens on a very small scale. Mm. So this upscaling and so on, do you see a problem there? Or Because you talked about it, we need projects to demonstrate that. But what about upscaling? How do we get China to take it on? And not uh, just a small part of I China? would say that the way to go forward is creating a sustainable mechanism in trying to internalize this in the formal okay. economy okay. Uh, mm -hmm. and that's very important and that's now it's still like I said project based so a lot of uh, uh, companies uh, a lot of uh, you know Swedish companies for example are doing goods mm. but um, but in some ways also some of the ones that are doing good they're not really disclosing how good they are mm. and it's actually there should be you know there should be a value of being good not just because philosophically it's a good thing it's also it's a good thing but there should be a, like real former uh, a formal um, incentive mechanism in the economy mm, okay. uh, to take into account of this all right so we'll go back a little bit to how the overall structure of society and the economy Jonas, in, in a way, you know, you could, you could now take the stand and say, well, it's great to hear that we need, first mm -hmm. of all, the framework of governments before we can do anything, you know. But I know you're much more proactive in that. And at the same time, we are saying business must mm -hmm. take the lead when governments are slow to act. Um, and we have all this research coming from Pavan Sukhdev and his, and his team. We have T, we now have this uh, investigation. We have a lot of other research being presented. How, how do you take that on? How, how do you translate that? Sure. So um, as Pavan and those of you working in the financial industry will know is uh, that it's a deeply conservative business. So uh, I would say on the most part um, it's um, looking at uh, institutions globally, it's, it's probably business as usual. Mm -hmm. Not, and, and primarily because a lot of finance professionals feels that this or, or perceives this to be a field that is vastly different from what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's not. Um, it's about understanding the risks and the possibilities in, uh, for the investments that you, decisions that you make today. I think there's a handful of institutions uh, in Scandinavia that do quite a lot of work and do some good work around this. Um, Storebrand has been uh, conducting sustainability analysis for the past 15 years. So mm -hmm. We do it for two reasons. We know that our clients care a great deal about their money being invested in a responsible way, but also because we know that it makes us a better asset manager if we can understand the risks and possibilities that are tied to the um, global trends within the sustainability. Um, and I think there are some challenges uh, in terms of uh, ecosystem services as to how we can 
develop performance indicators across sectors so that we can understand and compare companies. I mean, we work at our company to try and move our investments to the companies that are best positioned within each sector in terms of the, um, the sustainability trends. Uh, but I think water is one area where there is a lot of information, where a lot of companies disclose and where there's a lot of external resources to be um, consulted. And, um, and it's a very, very illustrative um, example as well. If you look at uh, Texas, for example, southwest um, uh, United States, uh, coming through uh, three straight years of record uh, droughts and um, uh, manufacturing industries in that area is being forced to build pipelines to other parts of the country to secure water uh, for their production because the, the groundwater is uh, simply not there anymore. And the costs associated with that are affecting their cash flow and profitability already this year. So, it's a, so, so again, in trying to um, convince or to um, sell this case to investment professionals, I think it's, it's quite key to demonstrate that this is not something that they may agree on the general terms, but when is it when will this be a, a real issue for my investments? And, and that's uh, quite an illustrative case that mm. this is something that will af affect profitability also in, in the near term. Uh, in, um, w there's also a decent amount of uh, uh, data on uh, um, climate risk in, uh, in uh, supply chain for consumer staple industries, for example. So food is one, uh, food industry is one, one area where we look. Um, and I think there's also quite a lot of interesting things going on in other areas and from institutions that perhaps are not as vocal as, as Scandinavian institutional investors. So about a week ago I was in India visiting some private equity managers that we've, we have invested with and none of them talked about sustainability. And, um, but when I challenged them as to what they saw as the main value drivers in their investments, mm resource efficiency kept coming back. So actually it turned out that they were quite progressive and I think in many ways we're doing more things than, than we're doing. Mm. It's just that they're not talking about it as much or they're not using a different um, language. Mm. And so finally I think there's some really uh, encouraging developments going on in other parts of this industry. For example, some of the most uh, progressive institutions right now I believe are the um, college endowments in the United States where Students and uh, faculty are really putting pressure on the people who are managing their money uh, to, uh, uh, to do it in a responsible way. So mm -hmm. divesting from fossil fuels and, and taking into um, environmental uh, accounting in, into, um, into their investment decisions. So, um, and some of those institutions are quite big and quite well known, so, so, so it's getting a lot of spillover effect. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, I think there, uh, there's a long way to go, uh, but I think there's also s quite a few encouraging examples of um, mm -hmm. more institutions understanding that this is a necessity in, in, in order to be able to um, accurately uh, understand the risks and possibilities. Of mm. So we're future. moving in the right direction. I believe so. If, if, I, would, if I would make a survey, uh, you know, a, a secret survey, mm -hmm. so anonymous survey of all the employees in Swedbank, mm -hmm. okay, a bank like this, or in SCB, or whatever, in Swedish bank, and ask them if they think, you know, ecosystem services are important, how many, what it would, you know, how many would say yes? Um, the majority, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think from what, I don't know this on institutions, but I don't think it's dramatically different from the one I work for. And okay. uh, we know that our employees and our clients care a great deal about this. And when we ask them, is this important, they say yes. Now, the propor portion of that client group that actually acts on that yeah. uh, feeling is a lot less, but it's one of the fastest mm. growing uh, client segments in the Scandinavian markets today. That's good. So, so I think that there is a real interest, and more are, are, are more more people are actually acting on that as well. That's good, and I hope it's not like uh, you know when I lived in Reno, Nevada, they said it's the fastest growing state <laughs> of population. But on the other hand, if you have one person and one other person moves in, it's actually you know. <laughs> but anyway, no, that <laughs> set aside. But can, just before I ask uh, Pavan to come up as well, um, very briefly. Mm. This is very complex, you know, mm. still. It, it is quite complex, you know, ecosystem services. I'm sure the leadership in, 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 sort of in many corporations, they see it as important. And we, we talked a little bit about it beforehand also. The leadership, yes, they're all, yeah, great. And then you have the mid-level managers, oh, okay. 
we have to do something. And then you have all the guys down there saying, I already work 10 hours a day. Should I also make assessments about ecosystems and climate change and water and so on? And, you know, is there a risk? And, and what can we do you know, to integrate these aspects, but without causing complexity to be so large that in the end you can't really do anything almost? Yes, I will let you, but Jonas first. Sure. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely a necessity to integrate it into, into to the daily operations. And for us, um, assessing and understanding uh, risk of financial investments. So, um, and, and again, it goes to, to really make it, uh, rather than we're going to do this as well, mm. it's that we, we're going to continue together. doing what we do, but we need to take these areas into account as well in order to better understand the, co the companies that we invest in. So, so I think, and, and then I think the power of really being able to demonstrate that this makes a difference. So, um, and, and there are some very good examples. I know Harvard Business Review did a report about a year ago where they isolated the 10 most resource, 10 percent mm. most resource efficient companies of a global index and compared it to the, the broader index. And they found that over a, a five year period, I believe, uh, the most resource efficient companies actually outperformed the index with some 11%. Mm -hmm. So uh, then, then you kind of you get it into the same vocabulary, the same language as mm -hmm. the old, and then they see that it's not that vastly different from what we already do. And yes, this can actually help us achieve the goals that, that, we're, that we're trying to do. I think that is it's a very important point, actually. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think that is critical. Pavan, while you are coming up again, Maria, you also wanted to make a comment about this, so please. But Pavan, you, if you can join us. Well, my comment was just, uh, uh, it's about how to get the prices right. You know, you can't mm. expect that uh, companies will take the old responsibility that we were talking about. Uh, it's how to get the prices right. And there I think the economic instruments, again, are very important. Mm. If you look at, for example, the agriculture, forestry and fisheries sec sector uh, in Sweden, um, the contribution to GDP has diminished from 22% to 2% mm. between 1920 and 2000. You know, we don't even pay for the goods here, mm. in a way, you know. And, and the regulating services and so on are absolutely not included. And, okay. I, you know, as a single farmer company, you can't do so much about that. Mm. We have to get the pricing right. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do now, and I, I don't know if you all have pens and papers. I don't know if you, no. do you want a piece yes, of I paper, do. maybe? Thanks. Because I'm a bit uh, nasty to panelists, uh, and Thank you me. don't know that. Because <laughs> what I do is I, I don't you know, ask one person to give a question and then give you a chance to you know, give a long, long answer, and then we end up having only two questions. What I will do very soon is that I will take a sweep, and maybe you know, seven or eight comments, questions, reactions, short. Hmm. Tweet length. Yeah, <laughs> sweet length. And you, you note, you know, you note down. And then I'm going to invite you to respond in any way you want, you know, which means that you can be a bit selective, of course. But I will try to pick that up if you try to avoid something. But I don't ask you to answer everything. Okay. So I ask you also to keep it short. So we get a lot of flows. Okay. While you are thinking about this, very quickly from the three panelists, you know, and you don't need to uh, answer this, but was there anything in Pavan's presentation where you reacted and felt, hmm, I'm not sure about that. Um, it's difficult to put them on the spot, you know. You should ask me to go out of the room first. Exactly. Then <laughs> so we'll see. Any, anything that you said, hmm, that was, uh, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I, I'll make a short comment, but okay. it's actually not conflicting. But I said, what's very important is that we really need this paradigm shift Mm -hmm. Because this is actually also a paradigm shift, but also a paradigm shift in the role of, we're focusing again too much on government, but what are the roles of customers? Mm -hmm. What, you know, what we're paying, you know, when we pay for groceries now, it doesn't include the real values, the real cost of getting those food in the supermarket. Uh, but are we prepared to pay more? That's also the question. So I, I again, and it's pointed out about, you know, uh, consumerism, okay, and it goes back to us, each us, each okay. of us individually. Good, but I think that's good, you know, different levels, because it can become somewhat theoretical, but, you know, if you get it down to the people level. Anything from jo Jonas you I want can't to? think of anything uh, You're completely, oh, this is... No, I don't think, not necessarily. <laughs> I was thinking a little about um, subsidy models, as you were talking okay. in some areas, and uh, it's not, I can't really pinpoint what uh, specific slide or a specific issue, but I was thinking about 
um, what, what are the mechanisms and what, uh, what business models can work on their own and, 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 and where does a government subsidy and how do we as an investor, how can we get comfortable with investing in, in sectors that rely on subsidies? Ah. So that's one thing, just a reflection, but um, Good. maybe not so much of a challenge. And Maria, from your perspective, anything? Yes, I, I think I like really what you say, Pavan, about the values and rights. Mm. And I think, mm. what, sorry, values and, and price. price. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I think um, I really love your presentations, but it would be good to put a little bit more emphasis on the value. You know, we have to have a value-driven society. Mm. We can't put everything in price, mm. um, even if I say that we don't have the right price. Still, we have to be guided by some values in society. Okay. And I think also one other point is, uh, I know you have had discussions with Bolivia, for example, yes. on rights-based approach mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be very good to include a little bit more about mm -hmm. these kind of other value systems we have in the world, you know, mm -hmm. and also these distributional aspects of uh, benefits uh, in mm -hmm. another way. Mm -hmm. you, you, your book, Corporation 2020, again, it's an expo excellent expose of governments mm. and society. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a very good mm -hmm. basis yeah. for this more yeah. value-driven discussion. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So, Pavan, keep this on, on the paper there. And let me go out now to the audience. We have a little bit more than half an hour, so that's exactly what I wanted. We have a microphone there, one there. Start there, and the second one here. So, yes, please. And Second one is to the gentleman in the room. And say who you are. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Oliver from formerly Fu Talberg Foundation, now Future Earth Project. Two short questions, um, both, well, both to Pavan, but I'm sure others have something to say. First, um, it's clearly difficult to be consequential when looking at um, externalities for businesses because it, the Natura company. Um, thinking of expanding into Europe, but there are currently no ways of shipping or flying products from Brazil to Europe that do not use fossil fuels. So how do you think about that? How do we think mm -hmm. about trade? Trade, good. Um, and the second question is, um, we talk about pricing. Um, and once you find a price that, that reflects externalities, you immediately uh, cause an access disparity because mm. you have um, ease of access for people with money and problems for people without. And as soon as you then start subsidizing, you end up in a very complex political situation, which currently is seen as more or less impossible, politically mm. impossible. So how do you deal with access when um, natural resources become very expensive? Um, Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. I think that is interesting. I was also actually thinking about the whole trade issue and externality is actually becoming more and more mm. global. We quite often in Sweden talk about the fact that we have decoupled our economy from, you know, we are growing very rapidly and our fossil fuels consumption is going down or CO2 emissions are going down, which is not true if we look at consumption. You ex only if exported we look at your externalities. Exactly. So, it's excellent question. <laughs> Please. Okay, thank you. I'm Alexander Olsson from uh, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Where I'm a PhD student. Um, I'd like to, uh, both um, Filia, you were, um, said that the, the Swedish companies have more of a, a nature soul, soul because you know, we have a certain connection to nature in Sweden. And I, I listened to Thomas Hahn, uh, Maria's colleague, and he also said that, that uh, people who are educated on the value of the ecosystem service, mm -hmm. they tend to value the ecosystem service mm -hmm. higher than people who are not educated on this uh, question. At the same time, we see a rapid urbanization in the world. And as you said, uh, Filia, uh, large um, urbanized areas in, in, in many parts of the world are just increasing in size. Um, and, and the Swedish agriculture sector, I think, is something of 0.5% of the GDP or something like that. And you said 2%, the entire food producing sector in Sweden is 2% today. So how do we, and that's, that's a quite, quite detrimental uh, development in that case, if, mm. if it is like this, that people who are educated about the ecosystem services also value them higher. So how do we counteract that development in that case? How do we get people to actually apply for agriculture or universities and, and move back to the countryside and regain that connection with, with nature if, if that is so important? 
Okay, thank you very much. Remember, though, that they, they've at least shown that people in Stockholm wants to protect the wolf much more <laughs> than <laughs> out there in the countryside. So, you know, urban areas can sometimes be very green, at least if we keep the green out there somewhere. So, please, yes. Okay, my name is uh, Jacqueline Åkerblom. And I have a question, how, and I'm from uh, About Future, an independent consultant firm. Um, how should companies actually calculate um, these things when it's so difficult? I mean, even mm. if you want to internalize the externalities, such as carbon dioxide. I mean, if you want to put a value on it, uh, the Stern report, they said 40-something euro or 50. Uh, and the EU Commission now, the trade mm. emission, it's only a few euros. What values should you actually put in there when you start calculating? Good. So and I looked into the, the Puma report, uh, and, it's, and it's a very extensive um, um, calculations they've been doing. Really interesting. But how should a small, ordinary company mm -hmm. go about it? Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. We have two coming up, but you keep, you keep it, okay, for the time being. We can, we can give you the microphones, because now it starts to be a lot of things to keep in your mind here. Uh, <clears throat> but there, are, you know, there is some kind of commonality between the question. Hava, now I give you the chance mm. from the panel and also what you've heard from the audience. Sure. Um, thanks, Jonas and, and Phil, Philia, for your respective questions on investor response. I think if I may summarize your comment and consumer response. And I think these are important dimensions which I didn't really address in my presentation. So apologies for that. I was just trying to meet his deadline. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but um, basically the issue is in the case of consumers to see whether we can go beyond thinking of consumers as just consumers and rather thinking of them as citizens or God forbid even human beings, you know. So, um, <laughs> so we, we economists just amazing, right? How we the reductionism is just intellectual, emotional, spiritual, everything is just amazing. Uh, great. <laughs> Unfortunately, the world is a bit more complicated. But I think the, the the essence of my answer to that is to create empowerment empowerment models, which essentially enable citizens to actually influence advertising, and that bit is already happening. Mm. The, the fraction of advertising, which was generated by the corporation, maybe it was probably 98% or mm. 99%. And now I would say the balance is shifting, thanks to social media. The advertisement is a little bit more created by the consumer or the individual, the human being, as against created by the corporation. So mm. I think that shift is happening. But we don't see enough of a shift happening when understanding the issue of externalities. Mm because education is scarce, and I think we need that. We don't see enough of a, of a concern about why do I have to pay income tax? It's a good thing to work hard. Why can't we tax bads rather than goods? I don't see enough of that happening. So I think clearly the citizen needs to sort of wake up to these alternatives mm. and not assume that today's framework of taxation is the only one available. Um, and I think, again, finance, I think there's a lot of agitation. You know, we are the 99% and so on. There's a lot of agitation about the, the uh, banking crisis, uh, but and I've been down. I actually talked to this movement. Uh, I happened to be coincidentally teaching a course at Yale University at mm. that time. And the central yard at Yale was occupied by these blue tents. So I went down and chatted with them saying, you know, hello, you know, what do you think? What, what are you planning to do? And I couldn't get any solutions from them. And I didn't want to sound parochial, but I just wanted to understand how these people think. So to me, the learning of that experience was that today, the agitators are really not educated. And the educated, which is all the students I'm teaching, are just not agitating. Mm -hmm. So we have a double problem in civil society. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix this one, because this is actually just completely emaciating the potential impact of, of civil society. Mm -hmm. So I think there's actually a huge, I mean, I'm just sort of talking through various things which uh, strike me when I, when I think of you. And I, uh, your question. Uh, so there's actually a lot to be done in terms of the people response, the citizen response, the consumer response. And uh, equally with the investor response, although I've, I, I must apologize, I've traditionally been quite skeptical of the investor. Mm -hmm. To me, as, as a banker, the investor is basically a client, someone to whom you sell a funky derivative. If you understand it better than he does, that's good. If he, mm -hmm. he understands it as well as you do, well, you make less money. <laughs> so this, my attitude maybe is colored by my 25 mm -hmm. years of selling derivatives to sure. investors, right? So apologies for that. But having said that, I think investors tend to tend to, again, be reductionist in the sort of twos and ten, twenties culture. So thinking only in terms of, okay, how do I achieve my bottom line uh, objectives? And that is a huge problem because 
the tendency amongst the world at large is to say you must influence investors. They will make change happen. And my point is, well, I mean, even if the world, typically most funds are benchmarked. Hmm. So your typical fund, because it's benchmarked, so long as your performance beats benchmarks, you're doing fine with your clients, with, with the real money, with the uh, insurance companies, with high net worth investors, with mm. family trusts, with university funds, etc. So you're doing fine, so long as you're beating benchmarks. So what this means is, if based on our ridiculous economic model and its inevitable consequences, if we do nothing and the earth diminishes and our economy diminishes in value and all equities drop by 90%, so long as your portfolio has only dropped 85%, that's good. We're fine. <laughs> Not so but, fine and, th- and this is the challenge. How do you get mm. around that benchmarking issue when yet mm. every mm. major mm. portfolio, every major fund is always on a relative value basis? So the absolute return funds are typically much more speculative and in and out and more sort of the hedge fund types that we are looking at. Because we are measuring what we're we are measuring, valuing. We're measuring what we value, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, or well, rather, we're valuing what we're measuring, exactly. which is what's happening. Right? <laughs> so we're measuring benchmark. relative benchmarks, so that's what we're... So I think it's a huge challenge there, actually. I really haven't formulated on, uh, in any sort of convincing way to myself that mm-hmm. there is an answer using investors mm-hmm. because of this issue of one is the twos and twenties culture and the other mm-hmm. is this um, challenge of benchmarking. I think incentive levels generally are typically very wrong, as you say, both versus our... Our, our clients in terms of benchmarking, but also mm-hmm. internally as to how fund managers get evaluated, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, and it's always with the with the financial. And benchmark. how do you change that? We are looking at doing that. So we now rate all our co- all the companies in our investment universe uh, on a sustainability basis, and we so we can track portfolios mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. on a sustainability basis, and we can benchmark fund managers based on how sustainable their portfolios are according to our model. So. We haven't get gotten all the way to actually implementing that in terms of the incentive schemes, but it's certainly a goal to do that. Because there are examples, I think, of bonuses now being linked to yeah. also mm-hmm. these. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, so that's that's what we would like to do. That okay. kind of thing can. Good. So let me just quickly answer yeah. a couple of other comments, sure. if you don't mind, that I'll give to my colleagues on the panel. Um, to the question on uh, Jacqueline, yeah, uh, regarding your question on uh, how does how do calculations get done? Yeah, it's true. There are different. Uh, prices being used for something even as straightforward as carbon emission impacts. Turn review will be $85. True cost and my company will just extrapolate based on that. Uh, EU will have a different number. I forget what it is. Um, But the key thing is, which sector do you belong to? And is there a sectoral benchmark? And this is what I meant by we need to create that momentum for accounting for externalities, measuring externalities on a sectoral basis. It doesn't help if, I don't know which business you're in, but for the sake of argument, if you're a mini cement plant, and the rest of the cement industry that is Holcim, Lafarge, and Simex, and, and Simfor, and Intercement, and whoever is doing things on a particular basis, and if you're doing things somewhere else, then what's the value of the information mm. that you generate? So we really need to have sectoral benchmarks for these, and that's why it's really important to work in sectors. Um, even though you may have different approaches for water impacts and how do you calculate your life cycle analysis. So there are things that you need to do. If you are a big company, you can afford a full life cycle analysis. You should do it because that's part of GRI recommendations anyway. If you're a small company, you can still do a life cycle inventory because you know how much cement you're, calc- you're making and there is a kind of industry standard. There's, and you know the emissions are typically between 0.6 to 1.2 uh, tons of CO2 per ton of cement. So you know these things, right? So you can always make a first estimate. You may be wrong. You may like to think that you're at the 0.6 end of the range. Maybe you're at the 1.0 end of the range. So you might go wrong because of optimistic estimates, but you're not that far wrong. I mean, it's certainly less wrong than saying the answer is zero. Mm -hmm. So I think there are things that any company can do, even with public information available from LCA databases, including the European Union Commission's database. Do you think that big companies should take a bigger responsibility in, in the supply chain to support... Their, their suppliers, for instance, which are quite often smaller companies. You see, not, on, not only that, in, in terms of the calculation <laughs> yeah. challenge and, and creating the LCS, I think the big companies basically should be the ones who prepare the LCS. Yeah, okay. And mm-hmm. the information from their LCS will help create the benchmarks, which can go into the so-called lighter life cycle inventory, which is just putting X amount of input, Y amount of output, okay. that kind of... Yeah, so these, these are things which... So do not despair. No matter how small your company is, it can be done, Right. And I can give you a first cut estimate for very, as I said, very low price. Take my card. <laughs> yeah. Indians, I pay them tea peanuts, seriously. Yeah. So. 
you, you, uh, you know, if I can let you come in only because now I also want, I want other, other panelists to, to sort of drop in here. But the issue of trade, mm. and uh, can you mention something about that? I mean, how, how do you get that uh, into your equation? The fact that, you know, externality is okay, you can look at the company level and so on, but when you look at societies and the fact that we are exporting a lot of our externalities. You know, the, uh, I mean, yes, you are. I mean, and, but the nature of the externality is that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an impact on third parties. And sure, you know, some of those third party impacts may be as a result of the value chain that's in Sweden, and some of it would be outside, outside. of Sweden. Mm -hmm. But when you are calculating externalities, you have, if, to. Yeah, you have to account for the whole lot. And mm -hmm. sure, I mean, you, you can, if you want, uh, estimate how much of that came from what part of your value chain. Mm -hmm. So all this is part of the approach that can be used. Um, uh, the discussion is now, I and mean, this is very recent discussion, some companies are doing these calculations, are a little scared at the total size of their impacts mm. for two reasons. One is that they're being asked by me and everyone else to do full value chain, right, from the cradle to the gate. And secondly, because they are being asked to look at global impacts. Mm. And they're coming back to me and saying, hang on, I'm a company in, in the USA, I'm a company in India, uh, even my government is not bothered about its mm. emissions impacts on the rest of the world. Why are you asking me to bother about it? Mm. To which my initial response was, don't be silly, you have to do it, be responsible. Now I'm kind of softening up and saying, okay, do two calculations. One is your domestic impacts, as in if you're an Indian company, what are your impacts of climate change mm. to India? And then do a global impact. So if you're saying that, you know, American and European companies don't care, why do you force me to do this? Then there is an answer. At least care for your own country. Nobody will deny you that and then do the full calculation just as MIS. Okay, so I think that's, that's good. good. Yeah. Uh, I would like uh, just to make, I think there are two important things that I would like to highlight. The first is the transparency and accountability of information yeah. because in the end this affects decision making. And this goes the same when we talk about externalities and trade. Uh, the problem is not saying like, okay, people should not fly. But people make choice whether how they fly, how they make the transportation choice. But what's important is there is information about the impacts of mm. this. Mm. And this, uh, uh, of course, affects decision making. That's one thing. And, and uh, again, the, when it comes to pricing and excess of disparity, also this is what I would like to highlight. It doesn't mean that when we take into account of uh, ecosystem services and we know that the price of an, uh, a commodity is very high, it just means that we exclude the poor from mm. accessing the right. That's a, that's a really separate thing. Uh, <laughs> because then we are actually, by, by taking it into account of ecosystem services, we are actually acknowledging the rights of those who actually have the rights and actually own the resources which is most of the cases, the poor, that they're not acknowledged. Yeah. So that's one thing. And um, I think there are also taboo that we have to, to break. And this taboo also in how we see our relationship with uh, natural resources, such as water. Mm. I think the, it's good that we, when we're talking about water as uh, human rights, uh, this is something that we, of course, that we have to um, really promote uh, when it comes to like some you know, uh, some uh, poor and developing countries that still have lack access to uh, water and sanitation. But on the other hand, I think it's very important that it's still a scarce resources. Mm -hmm. And it means we cannot just use water as much as we want. That, and this, uh, this taboo needs to be, break, uh, to be broken. Mm -hmm. And it's the same when we talk about the agricultural subsidy. You know, they say, oh, uh, farmers are, you know, again, the vulnerable, of course, politically also very important. But actually, when we are doing this, we are creating costs, you know, again, external costs at the other part of the economy. And, and we have to talk about this openly. And uh, uh, the, the solution, in the way I see it, it's not protecting the farm with subsidy because it actually creates other mm. costs, but actually how to make them, you know, taking into account of, uh, of this ecosystem services better. What kind of incentive, what kind of mechanisms mm. to make them uh, take into, to have like, you know, better agricultural practices? Mm. So I think, I think this is also what very important. Very good. Thank you very much. Jonas, your, your sort of re reflections on, on mm. the questions. A couple of reflections. First to the last uh, question is to um, difficulty of calculating ex externalities. I think you're absolutely right. Um, but I'd be less concerned of finding the right number or the right even methodology, but start doing the work uh, means that you'll start understanding the risks and the possibilities associated with these, these questions. If you think about financial accounting, there's all these key ratios that are 
taken for granted among our corporations. But um, I, I would guess that when these were developed or when people started measuring these things, I don't know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, whatever, there was probably a big, you know, a wide range of, of methodologies. And but but you started doing it, and you started to understand the um, the risks and the uh, and the possibilities. So so that's I think the, the key thing is is to try and whichever number you use or, or methodology, you're going to get a better sense of the risk and the, and, and the, and the possibilities. And in terms of Swedish companies uh, having a nature soul, um, I think that's an interesting observation. In our sustainability rating, we, if we look globally, uh, we have a big overweight European companies, especially North uh, European. So yeah. we put together a retail fund uh, where we put in what we view as the 100 most sustainable listed companies in the world. And we actually have three Swedish companies in there. It's um, uh, Volvo, Alfa Laval, and uh, Atlas Copco. Mm. So I think that's, um, I think we have that heritage. I don't know, maybe it's cultural, maybe it's just that um, that the, the management has been earlier in uh, adopting these, um, these issues, or, or maybe it's because the, uh, the demand side has been stronger mm. in, in pushing it here. I'm not sure which it is, but I think it's an, uh, a correct observation that, that Swedish and Scandinavian companies tend to be fairly well positioned within these fields. Uh, just uh, very, very short. Would you agree, Pavan? Well, one, one point I really loved is this, this idea that, you know, the ratio calculations, mm -hmm. that when the P ratio was invented, it was like Einstein. <laughs> so, wow, I mean, how complicated <laughs> is this? And so I think if we have a, I call it PEX, those who are interested, uh, geeky can check into my website, find what that is. But basically a calculation of proper price earnings, as in true price versus true earnings. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think that's complicated today, but I bet you in five years' time, everyone will know yeah. what PEX is. I think and, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I totally agree with that. And uh, a couple of other points, I think, which you picked on uh, in terms of you picked on in terms of access, and I think Rebecca's question still probably remains unanswered. The uh, access issue, in terms of if we really, really price all externalities in, will that not prevent access to the poor? That's a great question because in some cases yes, in some cases no. And uh, part of the challenge is, of course, ensuring that nature's flows are provided through rights-based regimes and through appropriate access. So I, I do buy that kind of argument that something like water, when you, when you are thinking of creating a pricing regime for water, you need to recognize that there is actually a fundamental right to drink water and that denying people the right to access water is a problem. So you need to keep aside that as a free good, as basically mm -hmm. a public good. Then there's water use for industrial, agricultural, and commercial purposes. And then finally, there's water use for luxury, as in my swimming pool needs water. Mm. So that should be free, though. Uh, my one, but not yours, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to differentially price these different levels of necessity, if you'd like. And I think that, that is part of the, the challenge. But typically what also happens, Rebecca, is that very often our current economic system is bent, hell-bent, on creating private and market alternatives to public goods and services. Mm. And I think um, pricing externalities would actually help in that direction because it will, through a combination of rights-based access mm. and providing access to the, the, the poor the G, the, and the GDP of the poor, will ensure that the pricing of the private mm. alternative is not artificially lowered and compared to the pricing of the natural mm. alternative, which is the public good, which is usually for free or at least as much as it costs you to walk into the forest and gather it. Okay. So I think it will potentially have a positive impact on providing access, coupled with rights regimes. Can Thanks I, uh, a lot. Uh, no, I want to let Maria <laughs> come in <laughs> first here, because Maria has not had a chance to comment on the questions and so on. So please, Maria. Yeah, thanks, Pavan. I think your clarification was very good here. And um, just on trade, I mean, trade, when we f diminish, for example, our own COD, uh, people don't, might not even notice in a way if you aren't really fanatic about cod in, mm. in the store, you know, because then we can import other fish from somewhere else, so we export the externalities. And I don't think that companies will be able to deal with this international market failure, mm. you know. There is, again, we need to have sort of international agreements mm -hmm. on how to deal with these issues, and here it's responsibilities of states, mm. again. And just one more thing, I was reading now in the morning paper about uh, the tax escape <laughs> from uh, that multinational companies aren't paying the proper tax mm. in countries 
in developing countries, for example, for minerals, etc. So, and that is much, much huger, you, much larger than aid, of course, mm. International mm. Development Corporation, and that we need stronger rules for this kind of taxation, mm. and to deal with, um, for example, public resources, health, um, better management of natural resources, etc. Mm. So it's it's structural problems here, which governments has to deal with. I would mm. say it's not just companies again. Do you think there is a risk sometimes that we, we we sort of shy away from these very clear problems that we really know exist and, and start to talk about something which is more fluffy, you know, fluffy up here, ecosystem services and so on? Is that? I think that. Uh, I don't think it's uh, ecosystem services are fluffy because <laughs> I was <laughs> I hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> some relationship to nature again, mm. which I think you can use when you are going to have when you are supposed to take these these responsibilities as governments. You know, as I think uh, Pavan's um, yeah. different presentations um, demonstrate in a very pedagogic way. Mm. You know, so. Good. No, but it's 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 a very interesting point, and and I've seen as you said similar numbers that just from the mining industry in Africa, more money is flowing out from Africa mm. than the total aid yeah. mm. coming in. So it's a huge uh, transfer there. So we are uh, you know, approaching, uh, you're going to you know, get a chance to say a few <laughs> final words, but I want to get some reactions and points in, because I have promised already two, and I want to see how many else feel. Yes, yes, please. Education yes, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Nadine Vjellmarm. I'm from the first Swedish National Pension Fund. As you have already stated, uh, the financial sector is very conservative. The ecosystem service is very complex and difficult to understand for many in the financial services and so on. Uh, my question is, um, how do you make, wh what are the first steps in your training manual to mm. start the journey to take this on board? Where do you start uh, in this work? Um, Good. Concre be very concrete because I think the financial uh, sector needs um, really concrete advice of where to start. That's good. So keep that on your mind. I've seen a very short uh, quote on that, which is great. When the last plant is dead, uh, the humanity will discover that money tastes like shit. Um, <laughs> anyway, so please, that's a good start. <laughs> uh, Malna Chakraborty from Atlas Copco. Um, I would like to thank Pavan and all the panelists. It's been a fantastic session so far. Two very quick questions. Um, Pavan, I completely agree with you with taking a value chain approach, and I'm a big fan of disclosure, but I believe it needs to be actionable. And to that point, if we take a supply chain perspective, what we're really dealing with is very small, very, very small companies out in the supply chain, because even with a preliminary analysis, we didn't quite go into as much detail as Puma, but we've seen that our biggest impact is definitely out um, the further you go in the tiers. And then we're talking two to three people working in a tiny store, perhaps developing um, materials. Measuring the impact in the supply chain is one thing. Getting them to understand and report on these lines the same way we do with our report would actually make it actionable to allow us to work with them to improve if we knew where they were. What is the TEAB coalition doing with this respect towards small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. And second, super quick one, you me mentioned domestic impacts and global impacts. We're headquartered in Sweden. I'm not terribly concerned about our domestic impact. Through our customers and business partners, we're in 172 countries worldwide. Mm -hmm. Global impact is a massive project. How should we prioritize mm -hmm. our work? Okay, thanks a lot, and we had Yes, please. Yeah, Benoit Passar, I'm a marketing and communication executive. Uh, and I would like to get back to your question, your poll, uh, excellent poll at the beginning, Johan, and you asked different categories. There was one missing completely, there was the journalist and the, uh, and the uh, public opinion representation, so to say. Uh, the politicians left the first, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> in any case, <laughs> In any case, and Pavan, that's a question for you. I've worked on my life with excellent and intelligent people always claiming that they know better. Um, and communication is there in between to try to uh, uh, bridge the gap. So are there any good initiatives except from spending money, add money to do uh, uh, corporate bashing and saying that we're a bit greener? Are there good, good uh, news agencies or whatever initiatives to bring arts, education, uh, culture broadly to make those things very complex that we only we can understand but 
if we want the rest of the world to understand, so what are we going to do there? Media, communication, the rest of it. Excellent. How many are from media journalists in here? You see? Not bad. Three. That's the three most important. So, excellent questions. What, what's going to happen now is we have six minutes left and the organizers have a couple, you know, a minute in the end, which means, you know, one minute each to try to pick up some of these points and if you have a final word, that you're such excellent people, so one minute for you is forever. Uh, the question is, who wants to start? I put Jonas on the spot. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try and address the last questions here. Um, um, in terms of how to get started, I guess the questions were primarily directed to Pavan, but I'll, I'll, I'll pitch in. Um, That's interesting for your perspective. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, looking at the financial industry, um, I think um, everyone asks, so when we talk about global trends, okay, so we, we have three main global trends which we think are, are, are the most important in, in sustainable development. I'm not going to go through them, but... Most people agree, but they say, when will this be an issue for my investments? Mm. And start to, so, so I think the key is to start to really frame it within an investment horizon. So, okay, we talk to our clients about investing in the equity market. We typically say you need five to ten years in, uh, horizon. What are the sort of main sustainability themes that will be, will affect corporations in a major way in the next, mm. in the next few years? And start, so, so I think what I'm trying to say is that do it from a bottom-up perspective mm. rather than a top-down when it comes to cons so the financial industry, typically middle-aged men, right? Uh, probably the hardest uh, demographic to convert anywhere. So if, you yeah, if they don't believe in climate change to start with, right. you're not going to get very far. You're not going to have a very high conversion rate. So try to start bottom-up and talk about how it's going to affect financial performance, how it's going to drive profitability with mm. corporations in the future. I think you're going to have a lot better success uh, doing it that way. But don't you need both, though? Because I, I know we, we tend to sort of say, well, mm. let's go bottom-up. Mm. But we often hear, if you don't have the top mm. with you, you know, you can never do it. Yeah, probably. You probably need both. And, of okay. course, you need to understand what you're trying to achieve by, by looking bottom-up. But I think in terms of trying to get work done within financial institutions, it's better to use the language and the tools that they're used to. Of mm. course, that needs to be anchored in a, in a sort of top-level okay. vision as to what's going to happen to the world in the, in the coming years. So all middle-aged men, stand up and <laughs> fight and be well-informed. I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> financial, I just love this, Jonas. <laughs> financial service industry is mostly middle-aged men, mm. the most difficult to convert to anything. Mm. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, one, I'm part of the problem. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, one, one exception. I'm uh, probably the exception that proves the rule, though. Uh, Wait a second. Yeah, I will yeah. give, you, give you the last yeah. word. So, yeah. Philia. Yeah. Uh, again, I think the, the important thing for me, again, is information. When we talk about this education, it's basically about information, translating the information uh, in the right form in, uh, in according to what it's needed. Mm. For the poor, this is, they don't have this information. I mean, they don't have to be highly educated, but they need to have the right information. And related to this information is, of course, institutional issues. It's about uh, govern, uh, government uh, role in this case. Uh, it's about defining property rights. Yeah. What is access? Uh, how access is defined? This is property rights. And if it's not clearly defined, then you know what are the rules of the mechanism? So this is a bit blurry. Mm. And again, including to have the right incentive mechanism. This, is, of course, the role of the government, uh, you know, as the arbitrage in this case, in the economy. Uh, so again, uh, and we see also in terms of institutional issues, then it goes uh, one in hand with good governance. Mm. Again, uh, when you have weak uh, governance, then of course, the information is most likely to be concentrated. Mm. And now we have the media, and this is very important, the role of media, that to disseminate this information to then empower like all the different actors. So I think that's very important. Okay, thank you very much. Maria, yes. uh, final points from you, but also, uh, you know, and you don't need to answer this question that I'm sort of adding to you, but what's the role of research now? Is there any role any longer? Uh, yes, I really agree with mm. what you say, Philia, and so And the role of research, yes, uh, in, in, this, um, in, the, in the inquiry, we also propose better incitaments um, for instruments for how to get the researchers out in society to do mm. research together with companies, and other entities in society. Mm. And um, I think that's crucial. Uh, we already work like that at Stockholm Resilience Center, as you know. Mm. And um, 
that is one thing. And I, I would encourage people to actually read these 25 action points in this the summary and comment on it to the government because we need help now. We had eight months to do this, and it would be excellent to have mm. comments, improvements on this proposal from us uh, to the government. And then one last point here is that uh, connected to art and science. Uh, the picture here is the uh, Leonardo Viteri's Leonardo. <laughs> Um, yeah. Avicii. Exactly. Uh, his Vitruvian man, you know, which is a symbol for art and science. And I think it really needs to be, you know, we need to reach out to, be, to the, sort of the society's, the value base mm. of society with these issues as well, which where art has uh, uh, its, its great contribution. And one last thing is one of the proposals we have in this um, inquiry is um, to, to have a committee for ecosystem services during a limited time until 2018 that could actually work as a catalysis, catalyzer uh, in Swedish society for business and innovation and for municipalities mm. and so on. You know, to, to share knowledge, to stimulate uh, these kind of developments, reporting, etc., etc., and to work together with companies on these issues. And I think um, it's, it would be really good to have that committee in place, I would say. Excellent. Thank you very much. And of course, a number of organizations here did actually collaborate with the Royal Dramatic Theatre this Saturday and had a big event there. And what we could say is that art, because that was also included, opened the minds of the people very much. So the scientific messages actually penetrates much better. So, Pavan Sukhtev. Yeah, I was at that event. I had. Uh, oh, you were there. I was very, very moved by the, the singing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I had two excellent Swedish translators helping me with the rest. Mm -hmm. um, friends. <laughs> now, uh, to question on the finance, uh, what can the finance industry do? Uh, there are basically two uh, calculations which I would recommend. One is if you look at your loan portfolio, you can do a portfolio analysis of externalities. So by portfolio, what is the total size of your externalities? Because what is a risk today, which is an externality, can be a cost tomorrow. So mm -hmm. as a lending banker, you need to know what the total potential risk out there is. And the, the, the second is looking at specific, when you go into the detail, once you've done the first step, is to look into the detail and actually ask some of your most worrying sectors, those with really significant externalities, to start reporting them to you, because that's going to make a difference both to your risk assessments and analysis, as well as to responses from that particular sector. Mm -hmm. So I think these are two things, specific, explicit, concrete. As I said, more detail available on request at a price. Okay. Um, and the question from Atlas Copco uh, can be done, actually. It is true that the... the very small uh, enterprise, medium, SME, uh, um, does not provide much granularity of information, but you know your supply chain. You can estimate their externality. Well, I mean, yeah. you know reasonably well your supply chain, yeah. You, you know, you have a rough idea as to you know, what kind of impacts there are on leather. If, even if you don't know specifically where, for the sake of argument, you know, whatever it is that you make, in the case of Puma, they also had a very large number of suppliers of cotton, of rubber, and of leather. They had actual measurements in a few places, and they had to extend those measurements to others. So that means that the answer is not 100% perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than zero, which is 100% wrong. Mm. That's what I would say to that. Thank you very much. A warm applause to the panel and to Pavan Sukta. <laughs> you have to understand that this is the 54th seminar of Pavan Sukta this week. Uh, you know. Somehow, close, you know, <laughs> close to. Uh, very, very shortly, there are white papers uh, on your, or your seats. There are evaluations. Please, please, please fill them out. Uh, hand them over to Matthew sitting over there because we are very interested to get feedback. It's important for us to understand what you as audience want and what we can do better. It's really excellent, apart from the organizations behind uh, the seminar, two of them, and you see the signs here, Siani, the Swedish International Agricultural Network Initiative and the Swedish Waterhouse, their role is really to bring together a lot of different stakeholders to meet, to discuss, fight a little bit more, hopefully, in the future. We are too, <laughs> too much consensus here. <laughs> um, and, and you really you know, move things forward. Uh, Madeleine, Nikolai, you represent these organizations. I leave the final word to you, I guess, maybe. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Um, yes, from the organizers, we have many organizers here. SCI and Stockholm Resilience Center are also organizing at SWECIF. So we, but um, it's, it's really nice to be able to do this in collaboration because we, from Siani and Swedish Waterhouse, we realize we cannot work without each other. So we have to do these collaborations together. And we will continue to do so. And we are very pleased now to work with the private sector through CIFSIF, and we look forward to more arrangements. And Pavan, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. We know that you've been so busy. And thank you also to the panel. And thank you to Yuan, who is not so easy to schedule, but he said, Pavan, I want to moderate. So, thank so you. Great, great moderation. <laughs>